Hey everyone, welcome to Logan Smosh Pick. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Let's launch into another episode of Rock and Read. This is the 100th Rock and Read episode. Wow, what a marvelous milestone. I never expected to get this far. Rock and Read is definitely the most time consuming series on my channel, but it's also a lot of fun. Thank you so much to all the people who watch every week. I can't thank you enough. I want to keep this series going as long as possible. Anyway, back to the book. Today we'll read part one of chapter five of White Line Fever by Lemmy. Chapter five is longer than the Cubs World Series losing streak, so I decided to split chapter five into two parts. Part one is called Hawkwind. Here we go. My association with Hawkwind began with Dick Mick. The instrument he played in the band was a small box with two knobs that sat on a card table. It was called a ring modulator, but it was actually an audio generator that went out of human hearing at both high and low end. If it went up, you would lose your balance and fall down and vomit. If it went down, you your pants. You can make people have epileptic fits with this contraption. On stage, Dick Mick could pick out the audience members who were susceptible. When we were playing in Hawkwind together, I'd go up to him and say, any good ones? He'd say, yeah, that guy there. See that? And he'd twist the knob. Vroom! And the guy would start flopping about. Amazing things you can do with sound. But of course, we could never tell for sure if it was the audio generator or if it was because we had spiked all the food with acid before the gig. But as usual, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, it was Dick Mick who got me in Hawkwind. He was running around looking for speed, and of course he found me, eventually. I was living with this girl in a squat on Gloucester Road in London, and she ran into him. Oh, I've got a friend at home who takes pills, she said. So we came round and we discovered that we had a mutual interest in discovering how long the human body can be made to jump about without stopping. We went on something of a binge that lasted about three weeks, during which we had about two hours sleep. He had decided he was going to India to find the Suffolk secret, or some <laughs> mystical <laughs> like that. But he only got as far as Gloucester Road, which is in the wrong direction anyway, and then he gave up. He'd found me anyhow, and that was fine with him, because he was the only speed freak in Hawkwind. The rest of them were acid heads, and he wanted some company. I had seen Hawkwind before. Not at the beginning, when they were known as Group X, though. The entire audience looked like they were having an epileptic fit, all 600 of them doing the same move. I remember thinking, well, I have to join them. I can't watch them. I wanted to get a spot playing guitar. Their lead guitarist, Ho Lloyd Langton, had just left the band. Disappeared, really. They had been doing a gig at the Isle of Wight Festival. They weren't really playing at the festival, though. They played outside of the festival. How's that for being alternative? Anyway, a bunch of them were sitting around a campfire. Who had done something like eight tabs of acid? I'm going for a walk, lads, he told the others. Went over a hill, and nobody saw him again for something like five years. That's the way things were in Hawkwind. Loose. Very loose. Who did reemerge a few years later in a band called Widowmaker? Not D. Snyder's 1990s project, which we'll come to later. So I was hoping for the guitar slot, but I wound up on bass instead. In fact, the day I joined Hawkwind was when I first started playing bass. It was in August 1971. The band had an open-air gig at Palace Square in Notting Hill Gate, and the bassist, who was Dave Anderson at the time, didn't show up. But like an idiot, he left his bass in the van, which paves the way for a successor, doesn't it? You're almost inviting somebody to come along and take the job off you, which I did. Apparently Dave didn't like doing free festivals like the one Hawkwind was doing that night. He wanted to be paid all the time, and the band was into doing all these benefit shows. I remember us playing in defense of the Stoke Newington 8, whoever they were. They had been put in jail for some thing, and we thought it wasn't fair because we were freaks, and everything wasn't fair because of the pigs, you know, all that crap that you talked to each other in those days. So we were doing all these gigs for these people, but the whole time we were getting conned. The organizers of those gigs had pockets everywhere. Quite a racket that used to be. Still is, really, but once again, I digress. 
Anyhow, here was Hawkwind at Palace Square with no bass player, and somebody was running around asking, who plays bass? Dick Mick, seeing his opportunity to have a full-time partner in speed, pointed at me and said, he does. I hissed at him, because I'd never played bass in my life. So Nick Turner, who played saxophone and sang, came over to me and said in very important tones, make some noises in E. This is called, you shouldn't do that, and walked off again. I mean, that's a whole lot of information, isn't it? And then, they opened with another song anyway. It must have gone alright, because I was with them for four years. They never officially told me I was in that band the whole time. Del Detmar, the synthesizer player, sold me a hop bass, which he got in an auction at Heathrow Airport for about 27 pounds. I still haven't paid him back for it. As I said earlier, Hawkwind was a very loose outfit. Every few months there was a change in the lineup. People would come and go. You were never quite sure who was in the band at any one time. At least, you were never sure who would show up. At one point, there were nine of us in the band, and then just a few weeks later, there were only five of us, and there were six, and seven, and five again. Every picture you see, it was different people in the band. It was very strange. Dave Brock, who sang and played guitar, founded the band in July of 1969, and he's been its only constant member over the years. It's his band, really, the same as Motorhead is mine. Hawkwind would not exist without him, and even he would disappear occasionally. He would go through these, like, nature boy phases, that's what we used to call them, striding out into the fields with a staff, naked but for a loincloth, and you couldn't get to him. I mean, there was no point in saying, Dave, we've got a gig tonight, because he was gone. He was busy being nature boy, right? In addition to being the main part of Hawkwind's power core, Dave also wrote most of the songs, but he would never write with anybody else in the band. At least with Motorhead, I gave the others credit, but Dave was all self-sufficient. I learned a lot from him really about vision and tenacity, things I already knew about, but watching him bolstered my confidence. He just made me sure of it. He had his quirks too, like his spanking fantasies. He used to pass schoolgirls on the road and lean out of his car yelling, Spank! 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 Hello girls! Spanky! Spanky! While he was tripping, he was always convinced that he had bitten off his tongue. He never had, of course, but he used to keep a red bandana in his back pocket and he would wipe his mouth with it. Then, when he saw the bandana was all red, ARG! And off he'd go. One time in Grandchester, we pulled that trick on him, and it took me 45 minutes to talk him down. I was tripping at the time myself, so I probably wasn't doing a very good job. Dave was always trying to beat the tax man out of money. One time he was explaining to us, I went and bought this new place. I've ridden it off against the old place and got this farm, and they can't touch me. And it transpired that as he was telling us that in London, the marshals were going through his house in Devon and taking all the furniture. <laughs> Miraculous, that. Nick Turner was the other half of the power core in those days, since he was the front man, basically. He was in Hawkwind from the beginning, too, and he was one of those moral, self-righteous <laughs> holes as only Virgos can be. Sorry to any Virgos who are watching. Nick was the oldest one in Hawkwind, older even than Dave, and I think that's where some of his behavior came from. Like, on the one hand, he could be very old-fashioned, but he was also keen on showing off how outrageous he could be. I guess it was some sort of post-hippie midlife crisis, and he would do annoying things like play a saxophone through a wah-wah pedal right on top of the vocals. Whenever we got a new sound guy, Dave or I would tell him, singing sax out. I recall one time when Dave didn't show up for a gig in North London, and we rang up his house in Devon. His wife, who hardly ever spoke, told us, Oh, I don't know where he is. He took some mescaline and went for a walk. That was this morning, and I haven't seen him since. So Nick got this guy Twink, who later founded the Pink Fairies, to play lead. The only guitar we had had two strings on it, and he couldn't play either of them because he was a drummer. That was one of Nick's great decisions. He was also one of those who later got me fired from the band, so there you go. But Nick was occasionally a source of high amusement. One time he walked up to the mic holding his sack, which was plugged in, and he disappeared in this fusillade of blue sparks. We were all laughing. Yeah, great, Nick! He finally shot back into the amps. They fell on him, which gave me immense personal satisfaction. Another time we had a gig on an open stage that had this moat running in front of it. So we were playing and it was pouring rain. All these hippies were sitting under bits of plastic just sopping wet and buying hamburgers for 15 pounds. All that good festival. 
Part of the stage was under the bowl shape enclosure, but the front four feet were totally open and wet. Me and Dave were out there and Nick makes an entrance from the left, dressed as a frog. He had black cowboy boots, green tights, a green leotard, and a full rubber frog head on. He was holding the saxophone and capering. He was a great caperer, Nicky. So he came capering along the stage and I said to Dave, It's about time somebody pushed that frog into the pond. And as I said it, he skated straight into the water. I had to stop playing. I was laughing so hard. And then Stacia, our dancer, came up and tried to help him out, and she fell in with him. I was on my knees. <laughs> Helpless with laughter. Another time we were in Philadelphia or something like that, and he was doing his trick with the Josh sticks. He used to light these jock sticks and fill his mouth with lighter fluid. Then, with all the lights out, he'd go boom, and you'd get this big ball of fire. And this one night, he overdid the lighter fluid. He went boom and set his hand on fire there was this black silhouette hand in the dark surrounded by a halo of flames with a voice screaming ow 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 so we took him to hospital and he had blisters like sausages up his arm but he still played that night which showed fortitude i will say that he'd get drunk as a on wine and once in switzerland he walked out of the side of the stage and leaned on the pa and the whole thing collapsed on him the only part of him sticking out of the rubble was his arm, holding the sax. Poor Nicky, he could be a bit accident prone. Our drummer at the time was Terry Ellis. We called him Boris or Borellis. He used to wear nothing on stage. He'd come on wearing a pair of his old lady's knickers, that's all. But he'd take them off halfway through the first song anyway. He was a dynamite drummer, but his kept getting in the way. Free fall, you know, and he'd wind up hitting it with a stick. Ow! There'd be gaps in the music, but he was still excellent and an excellent character too. He used to work at his dad's scrapyard on the outskirts of Far Westland, and he was always coming to rehearsals and gigs in weird clothing he found there. One day he'd show up in a German army outfit, and another day he'd show up in an old woman's shawl. Then he got into downers, and that turned out to be his ruin. The last gig he ever did with us was at Glasgow University in January of 72. He fell out of the van on the way there. We stopped at a light and he thought he was there, so he opened the door and collapsed out onto the street. He was all over the road, his bags scattered and we didn't know he'd gotten out, so we just drove on. Later, we found him and somehow we got him to the gig. I remember Nazareth was supporting us and when they finished, we put up our gear and he walked on stage and sat there with his drumsticks crossed on the snare all night. Never played a single hit, so it was obviously time for him to go. A shame, really. We replaced him with Simon King, whom I knew from Opal Butterfly. He was another one who wound up getting me fired from Hawkwind, and I was the one responsible for getting him in the band. We also had this guy called Bob Calvert from South Africa, who was the resident poet. Half the time he showed up for the gigs, and the other half he didn't. When he was around, he'd read his poetry on stage, or that of sci-fi writer Michael Moorcock, who added to the band's mysterioso space warrior aura. But Bob had some very weird ideas. He wanted to go on stage with a typewriter around his neck on a guitar strap and type things and throw them to the audience. It's not going to work, Bob, I told him. It's never going to work. But he wouldn't believe me. Luckily, he never got a chance to try out that particular trick. Another time when we were playing Wembley Stadium, he came on stage wearing a witch's hat and a long black cape, carrying a sword and a trumpet. Then halfway through the second song, he attacked me with the sword. I was yelling, you and batting him about the head with my bass. Look, off. It was the biggest gig we'd ever played in our lives, and he was attacking me with a sword. What's wrong with this picture, you know? Bob was very bright, but he went nuts while he was working with us. He started taking a lot of Valium and hyperventilating and speaking much too fast and much too much, and he went down to this Buddhist retreat and Devin or somewhere, and this guy who was in charge, Bob's new guru, was obviously a charlatan. You know, hippies grouped around his feet, staring adoringly at this fount of wisdom. I just thought he was a And then Bob started getting really weird. You don't believe in him, man, do you? You don't realize his greatness. And all this eventually I had to pop him. He was playing with a piece of wire, and he hit me around the face with it, so I hit him back. He fell over, and when he got up, he was a much better guy, but he was falling apart mentally. 
He once got so bad, we put him in a cab with his girlfriend and sent him to check in at a mental hospital. Halfway there, he put a hammer lock on the driver, and the driver had to press a button under his dashboard so someone would come and fetch him. A real mess, Bob was. We had to keep sending him to asylums, and they'd keep getting him locked up for like three or four days and then send him back out. It was a very difficult time for him. It was even more difficult for the rest of us. He's dead now, had a heart attack, at a much too young an age. He was quite talented, but he wasn't as brilliant as people make out now. Of course, when you die, you become more brilliant by about 58%. You sell more records, and you become absolutely wonderful. Man, what a pity we didn't buy him these records while he was still alive, but still, I'm sure that's where I'm going. How about Motorhead? What a brilliant band. If only we'd seen them. But I like Bob. I played on his solo album, Captain Lockheed and the Starfighters, which he recorded in early 1974. He named it after that terrible plane, the F-104 Starfighter, which the Americans foisted onto Germany. There was a joke going around in Germany at the time. Do you want to buy a Starfighter? Buy an acre of ground and wait, because they were crashing all over Europe. Captain Lockheed was a good album. Brian, you know, produced and played on it, and some of the other guys who played on it were Dave and Nick, Simon King, Twink, and Adrian Wagner. I must get a copy of it one of these days. I had some wild times with Bob. When he got together with Viv Stanshall, the singer of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, it was like hell. Once, I was with Bob and Nick, and we were on our way to eat. We picked up Stan Scholl, who was standing at the curb. He was holding a briefcase and wearing this blue suit with big black checks on it, and his head was shaved because he was in the scene headband at the time. And he had a Homburg hat on, and he was chewing Valium. So we all went to this Greek restaurant, and Viv and Calvert started smashing plates on the floor. Off they went, screaming at each other across the table, having these convoluted intellectual discussions. It went on for hours. Then we went back to Stanshall's place, which was quite near our house. Don't go through the doors because of the turtles, Viv told us. He had all these tanks with terrapins in them and these little walkways between, and of course they fell off and went all over. So to get into the house, we had to go around the side of the porch and climb through a window in the hallway. So we got in that way and Bob trod on a turtle, and that started it between him and Viv all over again. Then we went upstairs and he had all these false limbs hanging off the ceiling and robots and these big piles of priceless 78s by people like Jelly Roll Morton, which Bob immediately fell into knocking them over and breaking them. About three hours later, I decided to go home. Just as I was leaving, one of them decided he must take a bath, and the other one got a chair and took it to the bathroom so they could go on screaming at each other. I thought I'd had enough, but I was wrong. At 7.30, I was wakened from a dead sleep by Stanchel, standing outside my window, screaming, You killed my terrapins! You. I yelled back, It was Bob! And I slammed the window shut. Stanchel's dead now, too. He went in early 95. In addition to the musicians and Bob, Hawkwind had several dancers. Stacia was one who stayed with us the longest. She was there through all the time I was in the band and left to get married not long after I was out. She was six foot two and had 52 inch tits. Quite an impressive sight. She was a bookbinder from Devon and when she first saw the band she took all her clothes off, painted her body from head to toe, and rolled around on the stage while they played. Then she wound up staying with them. She had a lot of male fans amongst her audience. We had a couple of other dancers too, one called Renee was double jointed. She was small and blonde and looked very pretty until presto, she started her contortions and everything twisted all wrong. And then we had Tony who was a professional dancer and could do pantomime. Occasionally Michael Moorcock would take part in some of our performances and recordings. He's on Warrior on the Edge of Time. More often though, Bob would recite stuff that he wrote. Hawkwind was inspired by him. The name comes from Moorcock's Hawk Moon series of books. He was great. We used to go around his house for some free food now and again, and he would have all these notices on his door. If I don't answer the first ring of the bell, don't ring it again or I'll come out and kill you. It means no. It means I'm not in. It means I don't want to see you. <laughs> off everybody, I'm writing. Leave me a loan. That was brilliant. All our equipment was painted in psychedelic colors by this guy, Barney Bubbles, another one who's dead now. He used fluorescent day glow paint and we'd throw ultraviolet lights on them. 
He also did our covers for Silver Machine and Dorme Falso Latido. He was really clever and did a lot of trippy art for us. The album covers in the early 70s were so much better than they are now. The designs were much more elaborate. If you can find an original copy of Space Ritual, you'll see what I mean. The whole thing folds out and it's loaded with art and photos and poetry. Now that's well worth your money. When you talk about packaging and getting an idea across to the public, that's it right there. Nowadays with CDs, everything's smaller, and the record companies are so miserable and cheap and nasty, they won't spend five cents more to make it look better. And remember that long box thing when CDs first came out? What the was that anyway? The CD was only half the size of the box, and you couldn't open the thing up to get your CD out. You had to use a carving knife, and you'd wind up cracking the jewel case and putting scratches all over it. And it took ages to persuade them to get rid of that long box. I remember them fighting over it when Motorhead was on Sony. People were leaving the company because of the loss of the long box. How's that for stupidity? Anyway, we made for one hell of a show. Hawkwind wasn't one of those hippy drippy peace and love outfits. We were a black nightmare. Although we had all these intense colored lights, the band was mostly in darkness. Above us, we had a huge light show. 18 screens showing things like melting oil, war and political scenes, odd mottos, animation. The music would just come blaring out with dancers writhing around on stage and Dick Mix shaking up the audience with the audio generator. It was quite an experience, especially since most of our fans were tripped out on acid to begin with, not to mention everybody in that band. That included me and Dick Mick, of course, just because we were Hawkwind's only speed freaks. It certainly didn't keep us from indulging in anything else we could get our hands on. There's one legend about how I was so loaded that supposedly I have to be propped up against my amp on stage so I wouldn't fall over. Well, as loaded as I may have been, I remember that show, and it's not true about my having to be propped up. That gig was at the Roadhouse in 1972 when we recorded the song Silver Machine and You Shouldn't Do That. That was a big venue. It was once an old engine shed where they used to turn the trains around on a huge turntable. These rock and roll people leased it and turned it into a venue by taking the turntable out and putting a stage at one end. There were still bits of locomotive lying around and... and it was a great place, but now it's used for theater troops. You know, Japanese acrobats and... Very interesting culturally, I guess, but back to my story. Dick Mick and I had been up for about three days prior, whacking down Dextrin. Then we got a bit paranoid and took some downers, Mandrix. But we thought it wasn't very interesting because it calmed us down too much. So we took some acid and then we took some mescaline to make it more colorful. It started getting a bit freaky, so we took a couple more Mandrax and then we took some more speed because we got too slowed down again. Then we went to the roadhouse. Dick Mick was driving, and he was really interested in the side of the road, so he kept steering over to look at it. Finally, we got up there, and we walked in the dressing room, and it was full of smoke. Everybody was smoking dope. So we sat there for a while, and somebody came in with some cocaine, and we had some of that. And then some black bombers, or black beauties, as they're known in the States. We each had eight of them. Oh yeah, and we took some more acid as well. By the time we had to go on stage, me and Dick Mick were like boards. Oh, Mike, I said, I can't move. Can you? No, he replied. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, but we got to get on stage soon. Oh, they'll help us, he assured me. The roadies hooked our boot heels onto the back of the stage and pushed us up, and they strapped my bass on me. Right, okay, I said. Which way is the audience, man? That way. How far? Ten yards. So I stepped up. One, two, three, four, five, right. Hit it. And that was one of the best live gigs we ever taped. The jamming between me and Brock was great, but I never saw the audience. We got Silver Machine, our only hit, and a number two at that from that gig. My vocals wound up on the recording, even though Bob sang it at the show. Bob wasn't on that night, and he sounded horrible. So everybody tried overdubbing it later, and I was the only one who sang it right. That was really my only time singing lead, except for the watcher on Dorme Fasso Latido, 
Lost Johnny on Hall of the Mountain Grill and Motorhead, which was a B-side for the single Kings of Speed, and later appeared on the re-release of Warrior on the Edge of Time. But I did sing a lot of backups. It was magical the time I spent with Hawkwind. We used to go to this huge deserted estate and trip out. It had immense overgrown gardens surrounding little pathways, ornamental lakes and tunnels all around this burned out house. It was like madness in there. The whole band was about 10 chicks and a couple more guys would climb over the wall and we'd get high and wander around. You'd find the occasional person tied in a knot under the tree, gibbering. That was a great time, the summer of 71. I can't remember it, but I'll never forget it. That's the end of part one. Let me know what you guys thought of part one in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.